Good evening. My name is Megan Castillo. I'm Town Hall's program manager. On behalf of the rest of the staff at Town Hall and our friends at Elliott Bay Book Company, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's virtual presentation with District Attorney Larry Krasner and Sean Scott as a part of our civic series. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Larry and Sean for appearing to help make that possible. If you share in Town Hall's vision for a robust community engaged in the arts, science and culture where everyone has a voice, please consider donating tonight or becoming a member. Town Hall is adding new programs every day. Upcoming events include a celebration of the 51st annual Earth Day with the Black Farmers Collective. Marlon Peterson in conversation with Darnell Moore on to discuss his personal 21st century abolition story and a new vision of justice. And Senator Maisie Hirono talks with Viet Thanh Nguyen about her journey to become the first Asian American woman and the only immigrant serving in the United States Senate. You can check out more of what's upcoming by visiting our online calendar at townhallseattle.org. Tonight's conversation will be about 60 minutes, including Q&A. Questions will be selected from those in the chat field at the bottom of the video play player, so please submit those at any time. We can also text questions to 206-504-2857, as noted in the chat. We cannot guarantee that we'll be able to address every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. For those who would like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The program will be available for rewatching immediately following the event. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civic series is supported by Real Networks Foundation, True Brown Foundation, KUOW, the Norcliffe Foundation, and Wincote Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. One final note, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of the book being presented tonight, please use the link in the chat below to buy through our partner bookseller, Elliott Bay Books. Larry Krasner is currently serving as the 26th District Attorney of Philadelphia. Krasner worked as a criminal defense and civil rights lawyer in Philadelphia for 30 years before being elected District Attorney in what was termed a landslide election in 2017. He has tried thousands of cases in criminal and civil court and represented countless defendants from groups such as ACT UP, Black Lives Matter, Casino Free Philadelphia, DACA Dreamers, and Decarcerate PA. Before becoming district attorney, he filled, filed more than 75 civil rights lawsuits against the police for corruption and physical abuse. Sean Scott is a Seattle-based writer and historian, a former Pramila Jayapal staffer and Bernie Sanders 2020 Washington State Field Director. He is currently the policy lead at the Statewide Poverty Action Network. His essays about popular culture and late capitalism have appeared in Sports Illustrated, The Guardian, and Jacob Magazine. He is the author of the paperback Millennials and the Moments That Made Us, a cultural history from, of the U.S. from 1982 to present, published in 2018, and the forthcoming hardcover from UW Press, Heartbreak City, Sports and the Progressive Movement in Urban America. Krasner's book, For the People, A Story of Justice and Power, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Sean Scott and Larry Krasner. All right. Uh Megan, thank you so much for that introduction, Larry. It is, it's good to be with you. Um, I actually vividly remember following along with uh, election results as they were sort of coming in in Philly um, in 2017. I had just joined the uh, Democratic Socialists of America, and I believe they endorsed you and were very excited about that, um, that race and the way it played out. So it's good to be able to chat with you this evening. You might be muted. <clears throat> I just said thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to our talk. Excellent. Um, so I want to I want to start here. We have seen a lot of elected officials who have sort of left office and had the opportunity to write their thoughts about their term or terms or political careers, sort of after the fact. Um, but you're in the uh, the unique position of actually still having an active career as um, a DA in Philly at the same time that we're able to sort of hear some of your thoughts about um, where you're at. So it's a, a really interesting 
um, I think, glimpse just into uh, governing in progress. So what what really prompted you to commit some of your thoughts and, and commit, um, you know, pen to paper to tell um, the story of what it's been like to be as active as you've been in, in Philly in your career? So <clears throat> needless to say, what a, what a great and complicated question. Um, I, I can't tell you, I know for sure, but I can tell you this, the book is actually, the book ends at the point when I'm sworn in, the book does not cover my time in office. It's really about everything that came before that. And what came before that was, uh, you know, all the people I saw in different contexts in my childhood, or when I was on a death penalty jury right out of college, or when I became a young public defender, it was all the people I saw and the experiences I had that made me think the way that I think about mm -hmm. criminal justice and about criminal justice reform. Um, it was those stories, you know, these are stories that I would tell at home at the dinner table. I would tell when I got back from court in my law office, or you would tell to the public defender across the office from you. But then they also became the stories that I told on the campaign trail. The arc of the book is actually the 98 days of a campaign trail and all of these thoughts and memories that are coming back and all these discussions that I'm having and the things that I'm learning from people in the community as I talk about these experiences with them. And I just felt like there needs to be a conversation that we can have with each other, especially for people who are not in the field. You know, I think fundamentally people relate to stories. They learn from stories. Certainly I do. And I wanted to have a conversation because I believe all real change happens at the level of culture. It's not going to be a magic law. It has to be at the level of culture. And if I can do anything to be part of that, that's what I want to do. Right. So you mentioned some of the some of the viewpoints. I wanted to sort of get into those a little bit. I mean, Philly has been, um, you know, since since at least the turn of um, the 18th or 19th to 20th century, um, W.B. Du Bois writes a book called The Philadelphia Negro in I believe that comes out in, in 1903. Um, and really since that point, since the great you know migration of African-Americans coming up from um, the South to Northern cities like Philly, going on through you know the city's civil rights history, it's really been kind of a, a flashpoint of um, black life and black political life in the city. So I'm curious about how sort of that setting informed a lot of the, um, the development or maturation of sort of your, your, the political viewpoint that you mentioned. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, so understand that right now, the white population of the city of Philadelphia is about 37%. Mm -hmm. um, this is a city where when you walk into a courthouse, you actually see slightly more black judges than white, slightly more women judges than men. It's a city that at this point in its history has seven Democrats for every Republican. And um, it is also the poorest of the 10 largest cities. So it's criminal justice culture has been a big deal for a long time. And this has been a very racist and a very divided city for a long time. Most of my knowledge of this <clears throat> is really just from having been in the area for 50 years. And the one figure that really kind of stands out for me is Frank Rizzo. Frank Rizzo is basically our Confederate general and his statue was just removed shortly after the George Floyd killing, his statue was finally removed after years of controversy and years of wanting it gone. He was a beat cop who became the chief of police, who became the mayor. <clears throat> and he really is responsible for a culture of explicitly brutal and explicitly racist policing that, that has not gone away entirely. His shadow is very long and it continues now. And it played out in all aspects of the city. This is a guy who, A, was opposed to desegregating schools, B, used to reverse the sign directionality for streets to try to isolate black neighborhoods. He was famous for the level at which unarmed black men were shot and killed through the back to the point where the United States government came in to try to do something about it. He was famous for deliberately strip searching black men in their neighborhoods. And his intent, of course, was to make it very clear who was in charge, at least as he saw it. Um, he is a terrible and looming figure in this town. And Part of what that has meant is that the police, to some extent in Philadelphia, have run the show for a long time. They have told district attorneys what to do, and district attorneys have done it. And, and you may not know this, but Arlen Specter, who became a U.S. senator and one of the gateways to the U.S. Supreme Court, he was a young district attorney in Philly before he went on to the U.S. Senate. Ed Rendell was a district attorney before he went on to be the mayor and then the governor and then best friends with Bill Clinton. So 
the position I hold as an elected district attorney is one that to a large extent has been controlled by the culture of Frank Rizzo, the culture of, uh, you know, the sixth largest city with the fourth largest police force. We have an outsized police force. And frankly, a lot of these DAs in the past did what they were told because they wanted to run statewide for governor, for senator. And they knew that if they were good with the fraternal order of police, which is what they call our police union, then, then that would be recognized all over the state. They might be city slickers, but they could win all over the state because they were good with the FOP. I'm the first one to be in this position who has taken a very different approach. You know, and part of it is I didn't run till I was 56 and I don't have, I didn't really want to be a politician. I'm a rather reluctant outsider, a politician. So I don't want to run for Senator governor or anything else. Part of it is that. And, but part of it is, you know, I, my whole career was really dedicated to criminal justice and um, I lived through 30 years when there was no accountability within policing because the DAs wouldn't impose it. So I was one of those few lawyers who is trying to use civil court as a way for there to be a level of accountability by suing them under you know, Section 1983, civil rights lawsuits, things of that sort. So Philadelphia is in many ways, if we were to do a play about a lot of the issues that, that I know you find so important and fascinating, a lot of the issues that are confronting the country right now, the set would be City Hall and the location would be that walk between City Hall and our criminal justice center. And then I walk over to the police, uh, you know, the police headquarters. Um, and what you would see in that little place that would be where Frank Rizzo's statue stood for 28 years before it was taken away in the middle of the night during the George Floyd protest. This is, this is a place that has national parks dedicated to freedom but has been the most incarcerated in the big cities and the most over-supervised on probation and parole of the big cities. It is a living lie. In the same way the United States is supposed to be the land of freedom, but it's the most incarcerated country in the world, Philadelphia is a case study. It is a kind of a living lie. Mm -hmm. But you know the, the beauty of it for me is that the people know what they want in Philly. What they want is real reform. Mm -hmm. It's the institutions. You know, It is the media to some extent. It's the centrist political leaders and it it is the courts it is these other institutions that don't want it but the people know what they want mm -hmm. so you're uh in philly i'm speaking to you from seattle where we have our own problematic to say the least history with a very very powerful police union in the seattle police officers guild that was uh, for many years i think one of the biggest institutional obstacles to um forget about police reform, even just basic police accountability, and certainly um, abolition as the conversation has started. Um, there are many baseline um, accountability measures that were, um, that they have fought tooth and nail in many of the biennial contracts that they negotiate with the city, um, because our police officers guild seem to operate with the same amount of power that they've got there in Philly. Um, we also had many city council members and many mayors over the years who were also very, very happy to um, do the bidding of um, our police officers guild to the chagrin of many community groups, including the ACLU that have tried to push back. So I, I want to I want to ask you about what some of the um, biggest institutional obstacles you think there might be um, to even police accountability, be those kind of cultural um, be they political, especially as I suspect there might be many similarities between uh, Philly and Seattle in this regard. And also if you could talk about some of the achievements in the face of that opposition that you are personally most proud of and that you uh, get the opportunity to highlight in your book. Sure. Well, <clears throat> I mean, it's not in the book because it, we've done it since we were in office, but, but our record for holding police accountable is, um, I mean, in a city where there was no accountability, we're unmatched, okay? That's not saying a whole lot. But, you know, for example, we currently have two pending homicide cases against police officers who killed people while, while those officers were on duty and in uniform. That has really never happened in Philly. 20 years ago, there was an, an effort. It was thrown out very early. Both of our cases are going to trial, right? So while it's not in the book, there has been a real level of police accountability that has caused us tremendous hostility um, aimed at us directly from the police union. Some of the smartest stuff that I learned about our police union came from talking to police officers. Um, and there are a lot of, of decent police officers who are not happy with the union. The bottom line is in most places they are required to be members. 
So for example, when I ran in 2017, I was endorsed by the Guardians, which is the African-American Officers Association. Um, and they also endorsed, you know, they endorsed Hillary Clinton at the same time that the main union is endorsing Donald Trump, right? But they're all required to be members of the FOP. So I think it's very important to look at to look at what an FOP or a brotherhood of whatever really is. And what they really are is organizations that are controlled by their retired membership. We have 6,500 active cops. We have almost 20,000 members of the FOP. And this means, as you might guess, that they are the voice of the past. In a place like Philly, our current active Policing is far more diverse than it used to be. There's a different experience. You know, you wrote about millennials. An awful lot of young officers have grown up with a brother or cousin or a schoolmate who got addicted to drugs, and they might have a slightly different attitude than they had 30 years ago. But the voice coming from the leader of the union is quite different than that voice. So in Philly, you'll find that the leadership has always been 100% white, 100% male. 100% Republican. And this is in a city where seven out of every eight votes are Democratic votes. Our FOP endorsed Donald Trump twice without even taking a vote of its members. They endorsed him twice. Um, They have recently had beers with the Proud Boys before January the 6th. They invited them into the officers only area of FOP Hall where they drank with the Proud Boys. They then lied. And by they, I mean the leader of the organization lied said he hadn't, but the Proud Boys were so proud they put it up on social media. So it came out. This this same leader has advocated for a police officer who was wearing a visible Nazi tattoo while he was in uniform. Um, They have also described, he personally has described Black Lives Matter as a, quote, pack of rabid animals, unquote. And he has never used the word murder to talk about what happened to George Floyd. Okay, that's what you are talking about. That is the voice of the past. And when you are dealing with that kind of a voice of the past, you're going to have a real problem because we are actually in 2021 and we're talking in 1959. I mean, that's what's going on here. We are talking to Frank Rizzo so many years later. That pattern repeats all over the country. I mean, if you even look at their names and think about their names for a second, they don't call themselves unions. They call themselves fraternal brotherhoods. Okay. Well, actually not everybody who is there is male, so it's misogynistic. But second, they don't call themselves unions because one of their first jobs was to crush unions. That's why they're all fraternal orders or brotherhood of or whatever it may be. Uh, We have a real problem when groups like that and leadership so controlled by an old guard ideology are able to wrap mayors around their fingers. They're able to demand things in contracts that are unconscionable. Just to, just to give you a, a, a quickie sample, not so long ago, our police union was able to negotiate lower penalties if you're driving a police car drunk. I mean, really? Come on now. So it, it's, this is what we have. I mean, this is what's going on all over the, all over the country. And that's why as one of, the, one of the people who's been fortunate enough to get elected to be a technician for what I see as a national grassroots movement for criminal justice reform, you know, we need to have a 2.0. We're making some progress with these progressive prosecutors. 10% of the U.S. as of today has elected a progressive and reelected a progressive prosecutor. That's a big deal because it was 0% about 10, 10, 12 years ago. Mm-hmm. But the 2.0 is your mayors. 2.0 is your mayors and it's your judges. It's your mayors who pick police commissioners and are made accountable for that. It's your mayors who are negotiating in one way or another with the police unions, it will be your legislatures that have come up with arbitration systems that always fix the outcome in favor of the police and against everybody else. And it's gonna be your judges. You know, Now that we can grab data, we need to grab data. And we-
on George Floyd's neck. That's, you know, that is what we are up against. And I have to tell you, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful, actually, that things will get better, but they got a lot better to get. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned January 6th and um, just the fact that I think that, you know, Seattle, where I am and Philly, where you are, uh, the respective uh, municipal police departments here, I think, are going neck and neck for seeing who actually had more officers that participated in the uh, in the coup attempt. Um, it seems like a very, very deep rooted cultural problem, to say the absolute least. Um, and also a problem of of resources and a, and a material problem in a sense. In Seattle, the police budget um, in 2020 was about $407 million. It dwarfed the city's annual spending on childcare, affordable housing, parks, zoos, libraries combined. Uh, do you see it as a similar kind of question of resources in Philadelphia that maybe if there were more budgetary scrutiny applied to um, the police department, maybe if there was more of a sense that um, police practices have to meet, you know, that rubber has to meet the road of the funding decisions that council and the mayor in, in Philadelphia are responsible for, that maybe it would be easier to get accountability then. Um, so just your thoughts in general on movements that have sprung up across the country, including in Philadelphia, that have said, we can talk about this as a moral issue as much as we want, but when we make it a material issue, then maybe we'll actually get to the change that we are demonstrating for. Well, <clears throat> absolutely. I mean, first of all, we, we are supposed to get to choose the future in our democracy. That's supposed to be the notion. Our budget for policing right now is $800 million in Philadelphia. And as I said, we are the poorest of the 10 largest cities, but somehow all these decades we could afford to have the fourth largest police department in the sixth largest city. The increase in the police budget in Philly during this, you know, supposedly liberal mayoral administration has been $120 million. And when I and black clergy in Philly and various other community-based organizations go around saying we need to put together $100 million for prevention of gun violence, what everybody says is, oh, we don't have $100 million. You don't? You just gave another $120 million to the Philadelphia Police Department over the last year. You just let them have record levels of overtime to the tune of $80 million in the last year. You know, this has been a perpetual problem in Philly. I can't speak to Seattle's experience, but it has always been, we ain't got no money for prevention, but we got oh so much money for punishment and oh so much money for a punitive approach. The truth is in Philly, you got more guns than ever. They're cheaper than ever. You got more drugs than ever. They're cheaper than ever. And this is at the end of basically 50 years of nothing but a punitive pro-carceral, give all the resources for jails and for police and for law enforcement approach. It's a completely failed approach. And that's why we should be taking resources that are currently in law enforcement and putting in it into the things that actually prevent crime. You know, I think that is probably one of the hallmarks of progressive prosecution. We believe the resources are in the wrong place. Uh, and we are quite certain that if we move them away <clears throat> from really stupid stuff and put them into public schooling, public education, reinvestment in neighborhoods that will, where, frankly, there's been deliberate disinvestment for, I mean, honestly, centuries. Mm -hmm. If we were to actually do that, then we will see very significantly lower levels of crime. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned sort of the timing of your book and where it sort of, you know, falls in in the span of your career in the sense that it doesn't include a lot of the stuff that um, you've had the opportunity to actually steward as an elected official. Um, I guess I'm, I'm kind of curious about what the process of writing, I assume most of that happening as you're, you know, sort of in the day to day of um, your actual, you know, job as a DA. Um, Curious if any of that time as a writer overlapped at all with what was going on with um, both quarantine and the nationwide referendum that we're living through in 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 this country during the day and at night. You're also reflecting on some of the um, sort of life experiences and frameworks that you're bringing to the table. And just how did that? How how did you negotiate all of that as a writer? 
Sure. So <clears throat> unlike you, I'm not a real writer. I'm not a real author. Um, although my, my father was. My father, you know, uh, volunteered for World War II after being a postal employee and um, having come from an immigrant family. And because he served in the Pacific in World War II, he could go to college. And so he, uh, you know, he went to Columbia University. He got himself a degree in creative writing and spent almost all of his years either as an author of books, most of them about crime, um, or writing other things of various different types. So while I am not a writer, I grew up in that house and I knew a little bit about it. His daily, which was to have, you know, period of hours set aside and he would always go in there. He'd either come out with gold or he'd come out with sand. That was not mine. My situation was essentially, this is Sunday. And, uh, you know, there's been plenty of DAs and mayors who were always at the football game and they were very visible and they made sure the cameras caught them. Some of them used to actually go down on basketball courts at halftime and, you know, dribble the ball with their kid and all that kind of stuff. I wrote a book. You know, I spent chunks of my Sunday uh, or my Saturday when I had time doing it. It wasn't really anything I could do during the week. But one of the things that actually was really interesting and very supportive is that I have to talk all the time. You know, I was a trial lawyer for a long time, but that's a different thing. When you become a chief prosecutor, yes, you have your nose in a certain number of cases, but an awful lot of what you do is you just communicate. And the process of writing about things that I believed and experience I, experiences I had made it a lot easier for me to speak because I had written down those words I wanted to use. I had ground through, you know, I've, I dug through and excavated these stories and narrowed them down. And often the things that I was putting into the manuscript became available to me when somebody asked a question in a certain place. So it was actually quite supportive. Now, was it quick? No. Originally, I thought I was going to write it in six months. Oh, no, indeed. It was more like two years because, you know, I had a kind of all consuming day job that's sort of like 14 hours a day. Um, but I did find that it also helped me to sort out the weirdness of my life, you know, because I didn't, I was 56 when I decided to run for office, feeling like I hadn't accomplished anything in my career because basically I got a lot of justice for individuals, but the whole time the system got worse. And so it kind of helped me sort out the weirdness of being a civil rights defense lawyer all those years, never wanting to be in politics, then running, then winning with a landslide, and then being in an office uh, that was in fact hostile to what I was trying to do, where I had to bring all this culture change. And that was a struggle. It was, it, it, it goes on and it goes on successfully, but that was a struggle to come into a place where an awful lot of people didn't want you there at all. So I found it, I found it really to be supportive uh, in that way. None of which actually makes me an author or a real writer, but I'm happy I did it. Absolutely. Um, so I want to encourage everybody to write questions that they might have um, in the chat. We're going to actually turn now to a couple of uh, a couple of audience questions. Um, I did want to ask you before we sort of sort of move in in the direction of uh, grabbing audience questions. You know, I think that you know for a lot of folks, because I'm seeing the word accountability come up a few times in questions that have been asked. Um, there are some folks that think that. Um, you know, policing is a matter of simply a few bad apples. There are other folks who believe in reform. Um, some other folks, you know, you mentioned centrism a little bit earlier, who might think that just basic accountability is the way to go. And of late, um, even though the idea has been around for centuries, the idea or notion of abolition has also gained increased visibility. Um, you know, I wonder about just sort of what you feel with respect to whether or not the issue is with police practices or police as an institution and how that has been sort of negotiated and, and talked about in the public sphere and maybe where you identify on that um, kind of spectrum of, of ideas or ideals. Um, well, I got to admit, I don't always understand that debate because abolition can mean a few things. You know, I have, I have been in a modern German prison in Berlin. This is a place where you wear your street clothes, where they pay you to take language classes because so many prisoners in Germany are immigrants who don't speak German. They pay you almost what they pay you on the street to do an industrial job. And in some of them, there is a locker for your keys because you can take your keys, go to your car, drive home and have dinner with your family and then come back to sleep in the jail at the end of that time. You know, this is a place where they don't have cages. They actually have rooms that kind of look like you're on an ocean liner. They're cramped. It ain't where you want to be, but it's a 100% different approach to jails and prisons than what we have here. 
And yet we find that in Germany, they have one ninth the rate of homicide, one ninth the rate of incarceration in a place that certainly has a history of some violence. So um, is that, I mean, have we abolished jails and prisons when they are so distinctly different than what we have in the United States or have we not? I don't know. I guess it depends on how you define things. I think an awful lot of these discussions about, um, you know, defund the police, it kind of depends on how you define it. I don't really see the practices of police as being different than the institution. I think the institution is arguably defined by the practices. But do we want to see fundamental and radical change in how we do policing? I absolutely do. Do I want to see fundamental, radical, transformational change in how we incarcerate people and reductions in that that are huge? Absolutely. That's what I want to see. And there are better models, frankly, everywhere than in the United States for how these things can be done. Mm-hmm. So it's, I think it's largely a question of how do, how do we find that? I, you know, I will say this just to put the point on the map so you get it. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is I grew up, I was a teenager in the era of serial killers being on the nightly news. First of all, we had nightly news, which we don't really anymore. And then it was one serial killer after another during a certain period. And I have these vivid memories. I mean, I can tick them off. Partly, I suppose I was fascinated because I was fascinated by crime. Partly, I was fascinated because some of these guys were killing uh, one teenage boy after another, John Wayne Gacy being one of them. And I was a teenage boy. So this was like the stuff of nightmares. These were my Grimm's fairy tales. But having lived through that period of time, I am not of the opinion that Charles Manson should come home to my house. I do not think Ted Bundy should be staying in a dorm full of young women. I think that those people belong in jail. And I think they belong in jail for a very long time, maybe their entire lives. So I'm not someone who believes that there is no place for custody. I do think that there is a necessary place for custody. It's just much, much, much smaller than what we have seen in the most incarcerated country in the world. So pivoting to the first of our uh, our audience questions, and I wanna to try to devote most of our remaining time with, with one another, Larry, to, to seeing what folks in the audience might be thinking. Um, you spent your time, and this is the question, you spent your time before being DA kind of fighting against the office. Do you think there is something fundamentally wrong or corrupt with the office? Should it exist as it is? Does it have too much power? Um, hmm. Well, there was quite a bit that was fundamentally wrong and corrupt with the office before. It was a win at all cost mentality uh, that didn't actually necessarily even care that much about guilt, whether you had actually committed the crime or not. The attitude was win at all costs. It, it was done with complete disregard to science, complete disregard to people's sacred constitutional rights. It was bad. It was uh, unrestrained, um, stupid governmental power used in ways that were racist, that were against the poor, and that did a hell of a lot of harm and continue. I actually think part of the decline in the city of Philadelphia, its economy, its tax base is owed to over prosecution. When you take generations of people swaths of people and you make them felons, you thereby disqualify them from from participating in the workforce. And you tell businesses not to come to your city because they're they're concerned about what kind of workforce they're going to have. Well, what kind of workforce are you going to have in Philly if everybody's a felon and none of them made it through your public schools because your tax base is so terrible? You have awful public schools. I mean, this is how you cause a city to spiral, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I mean, that's that's kind of how I see it, except I forgot the rest of your question. What was the rest of your question? Um, The question uh, goes on to ask uh, whether or not you think the office of D.A. should exist as it is. Right. Does it actually maybe have too much power? So um, I think it had too much power when it was run by devils. I don't actually think it has too much power now that we're trying to fix what the devil did. Let me just give you an example. The the level of mass incarceration, the the number of future years of jail that were pushed out by the old administration, we have cut in half in the space of three years. Work is not done. But, you know, most businesses are all excited about a 10 percent this or that. We're talking 50 percent. We have reduced the number of future years of mass supervision on probation and parole by two thirds. We have reduced the number of juveniles in these snake pit placements by 80%. The only way we could do that is with power. And I, you know, I just think we should be mighty careful in the era where we're finally getting 
some progressive people to do the people's will in office before we say, gee whiz, you shouldn't have any power. Nobody said that for centuries when you had prosecutors who were all about hanging them high. So, no, I, I don't think I should have less power. I think I have the right amount of power. And frankly, we have to push up against a lot of institutions. So if we take away all that power, I could see some pretty bad results coming from it. Mm-hmm. Um, the But the institution, you know, it it needs to follow principles that make sense. There it needs to be a restraint on its power. It needs to speak the truth all the time. It needs to try to correct its mistakes and it needs to apologize for those mistakes. We've had 18 exonerations, meaning 18 people exonerated who were innocent. In in almost every instance, I can tell you, I know for a fact that they were innocent. In some instances, I can tell you who committed the crime and got away with it because these innocent people were put in jail for 20, 25, 30 years. Um, And whenever we do an exoneration, which a judge has to approve, we apologize. We didn't put those people in jail, but the institution did. And the institution owes it to those people and to the public to apologize for all the dirty moves they pulled, the information they didn't turn over, the tips they didn't reveal. We owe it. And um, so I think it's necessary for us us to do that. It's no, I don't think I, I don't I don't see in my lifetime the elimination of prosecution. But I do think that there has been so much corruption in it for so long that we should be happy 10 percent of the country has elected progressive prosecutors to be their technicians. We should not take away their power and we should be trying very hard uh, now now that we have them in, for example, the biggest criminal justice jurisdiction in the United States, L.A. We should be trying very hard to uh, spread that movement to other big cities, to other areas of the country and to also spread it to our mayors and to our judges, because I think then you'll see sweeping change. Mm -hmm. So one of our other questions actually dovetails off of that pretty nicely. It's a pretty simple question. Uh, How can Seattle get a DA like Larry Krasner? Um, I suspect that some of the background for um, this question, given the the local context, everything that I mentioned earlier about the Police Officers Guild, uh, we had an elected official a number of years ago pen uh, an op-ed explaining in very, very blunt terms that um, protesters, because they were protesters, were not going to be immune from being incarcerated. Um, there was a, a lilt of, of glee, if I remember this uh, op-ed um, correctly. Um, and so I think a lot of people are probably listening to, you know, what you're saying, comparing that with um, some of the, the the rhetoric that we've heard and, and the facts of policing here in the city of Seattle um, and wondering what it would what it would sort of take to um, bring some of the movement that we saw in Philly that uh, helped you right into office, number one. Um, and number two, maybe just, you know, thinking more broadly about what was the political climate that you feel uh, you maybe had found advantageous, you know, as far as your sort of your aims and goals, whether or not, you know, maybe there if there wasn't such a, a chorus on the outside around, um, you know, repeated, you know, unjust uses of police force, maybe it would have been harder to get elected. Maybe it would have been harder to, um, you know, push some of the, 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 um, the governing philosophies that you're talking about into actual practice. So what does that look like for you? And and how could a, a similarly liberal, um, purportedly liberal, I should say, a major city like Seattle um, move a little bit, you know, closer in the in the right direction on this issue? So one of the things that um, I really loved writing about in the book is is just how insurgents win elections. And yes, I wrote about our election, but our election was really informed by a couple things. The first thing is my wife who ran for judge about 20 years ago. She had to run twice. She was a civil rights attorney working for employees against um, discriminatory employers. And she had zero political connections. She wasn't from Philly, but she had done good work for 15 years. And despite the fact that the machine in Philly was much stronger then than it is now, she was able as an insurgent, as an outsider to crack the code on how you win in machine town. A lot of those lessons that she taught me, we used in our campaign. But the other thing, and it's funny you mentioned this about protest. The other thing that we used was this galvanizing moment we had in Philly during the year 2000 when the Republican convention came to Philly. And the DA at that time, had four uh, basically went went for the throats of 420 protesters 
who were arrested. And I and a group of other attorneys ended up defending them for what ended up being a total of four years. We defended these 420 people, right? They do politi politics better than politicians. They did it better then. They do it better now. And it, I think it's very, very important to recognize that it's not that hard to beat the machine. It just isn't. You know, I even have lists of rules in this book about how you beat the machine. I'll, I'll just give you a taste. Um, one of the ways you beat the machine is that they do the same thing all the time. All you got to do is look at how they did it last time to know how they're going to use it, do it next time. But they don't know you. They don't see you coming. And they haven't actually... They don't actually have a book on you, nor do they take you seriously. So they're not taking you seriously as an advantage. You're coming with creative ideas and doing it a way they've never thought about, never heard of is an advantage. And if you have popular support, which she had because she'd spent so many years working for individuals, then you can turn out massive amounts of volunteers that they don't even see coming. I had it because I spent so many years, 25 years, my professional hobby was representing protesters and activists. You know, these are brilliant verbal people who are very persuasive. They win battles with no money and no tanks. They basically win it with grit and creativity and, and using their fingernails. The party ain't a match for that. The mainstream party is not a match for that. So the one thing the party does have, though, is it does have the ability to persuade you you can't beat them. That's kind of the only thing they have. Kind of the only thing they have is they have the ability to, for mind control to make you think that you can't beat them. Once you realize that their power is really, it is really, truly, mostly an illusion. And I'll tell you how I realized it. Once you realize that everything changes and then you really can see this kind of grassroots connection coming forward. The ideas that we put out, we're not just for activists. Activists were at peace. Millennials were at peace. But the truth is our number one voter was a 60-year-old African-American woman from the northwest section of the city, which is, um, I would say, a somewhat upscale working class section of the city. There was a bond of ideas. There was a bond of values and all that stuff came together. But let me tell you how I figured out that the power of the supposedly, all, you know, the, that the power of the party was an illusion. Uh, first of all, it was my wife's experience. We just went and got the list of all the polling places and figured out where most people would show up. And without the party support, we put volunteers out there and we figured out our volunteers were much better than theirs because ours knew Lisa. They knew my wife. They liked her. They cared about her. They respected her. They were verbal. The party was putting out political functionaries who, for the most part, didn't even know the candidate. And they were just up there in some kind of lukewarm, my feet hurt kind of way, saying, why don't you vote for Joe? Well, she's got somebody up there who says, will you vote for my friend Lisa Rao? She made sure I didn't lose my job, dot, 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 right? I mean, that ain't exactly rocket science. You're just looking at where the votes are. You're sending people who love you, who can match the neighborhood, who can talk to people and be, be persuasive to those places. But the second way that we really figured out what's going on with the party is that she almost beat them the first time as an insurgent with no connections, right? They had to kill themselves to beat her. Why? Because the way they get money from candidates is by making those candidates think they're accomplishing something. Most of the machine is picking winners at the finish line. They're not making winners. I mean, I'll give you an example. There was, there was a kind of a kingmaker in Philly who absolutely did not want me elected at all costs. And he had his reasons. His phrase was anyone but Krasner. He says that during the whole campaign, we get about three days short. It looks like I'm gonna win. He spends five, $6,000 on behalf of the organization he ran with Krasner for a DA t-shirts that had prominently on them, the logo of his organization. Now, why on earth would he do this for anyone but Krasner? Because the whole point was he was going to uh, flip the script and try to claim he had supported me all this time. So he puts all these T-shirts I didn't even want, didn't ask for out there to try to claim that he had been with me. They need you if you're going to win. They'll line up with you in the same way the Democratic Party narrowly beat my wife the first time and then supported her the second time. So there, you know, there are just some nuts and bolts about how you can get it done that we talk about in here. And I think it is in some ways, uh, it's just a, a democracy repair manual for what you can do in your town. Absolutely. I, I, uh, I think that, you know, given that we're in a, uh, an election year here in Seattle, um, we're getting ready to pick a new mayor, um, as well as voting on our city attorney position and a couple of council citywide seats that, um, Many folks who are watching will take keen interest in thinking about 
how this roadmap could play out in uh, in future elections here in the city. Um, another question, what steps do you think need to be taken to minimize or extinguish police brutality in the United States? Boy, that's um, what a lofty, wonderful goal. And oh my God, what are we up against? So, you know, it was a good day when you heard guilty, guilty, guilty. That was a good day. But it's also a drop in a bucket. And the historical bucket has been um, awful. We have functioned as if police officers inflicting violence upon civilians were a higher caste that in the law, they were given 100 excuses. And we have the situation in Pennsylvania for using that force that are not given to anyone else. Sometimes those excuses are actually unconstitutional, in my opinion. And you should know that we, we have a case right now where we went to the our Supreme Court, we're going to them now to try to change the law before trial, because we know with the laws that exist, it's going to be very, very hard to win, right? So you have to change the laws so they're actually fair. You have to change how people feel about it. And fortunately, we see that there is there is a shift. There's a shift post-Ferguson. There's a shift with George Floyd. There's a shift that coincides with the existence of the cell phone, because it is every it is the ubiquitous cell phone, the potential for video everywhere, that is telling the truth to people who don't want to believe it, but they just, at some point, at least most of them can't look away and they have to admit what has been going on for hundreds of years in the United States. They don't have a choice. So we have a change at a level of culture that is encouraging. We have a change uh, that will have to happen in terms of legislation. And, you know, for example, there is a proposal for federal legislation. Many states have, uh, have proposals there but it's, all, it's also gonna to have to happen in a very deeply cultural way within police departments. It's gonna to have to happen, and I think this is where it gets really tough. It's gonna to have to happen despite the existence of police unions that are entirely controlled by their retired membership um, who have a 1950s attitude, you know? I don't know exactly how we get around that, but I will say this, we've gotten a lot done with progressive prosecutions in a few places. There's a lot more to do I believe there's another 20 years of work to be done, but even by progressive prosecutors who are in place, because that's how long social justice movements take, more like 30 years, but I think we're about 10 years in. Mm -hmm. um, we are, oh my goodness, are we at the beginning when it comes to progressive police commissioners? And there are some, and there are some reformers out there, mm -hmm. but it's gonna take a very, very long time. It's gonna take uh, changing out a lot of people who've been doing things the wrong way for a long time and replacing them with people who come in with a different attitude, different values, different culture. You know, I'm I'm in an office where at this point, most of the lawyers have been hired by me, even though it's three years. And that's 300 lawyers to see change in how things function, as opposed to when we came in there and we'd hired none of them. And I was taking over a ship with somebody else's crew. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a challenge. I don't have all the answers for you, but I can tell you, we have to fight this at every level and it's gonna take a while, but we did have a good day. Mm -hmm. Right. So speaking of fighting at every level, um, our next question here from the audience is about um, whether or not the office of the DA has any power or influence over the private prison system. So does the office of the DA have any power or influence over the uh, private prison system? In Philly, no, we have no five private prisons in Philly, very few in Pennsylvania, but um I hope people don't lose sight of, of what a corrupt and awful institution public prisons and jails can be as well. The, you know, the way this stuff actually works is that Philly has no state prisons, but we have about, I think it's 27% of the state population. Effectively, you're looking at about 13,000 Philadelphians that are exported and they are overwhelmingly black and brown to state prisons that are in rural sections of the city. Why am I talking about this? because it explains almost everything. When they are exported to these counties, you're looking at counties that used to have coal and steel in Pennsylvania. They don't have it anymore, but they got a jail. And that prison is their industry. It supports their tax base, their school, the diner, the bar. It supports all of that. So it's good money for that county to put people, many of them black and brown, from Philly in there. What else do they get? Well, they get gerrymandering because they get to count the people who are in those jail cells as being residents of their county, even though those people came from Philly and will go back, they get highway funds 
because they count those people who cannot drive and are in those jail cells as being among their population and therefore it drives up that. So if you ever wonder why upstate legislators where in, who live in counties where they basically have uh, hunting violations to prosecute and they have the occasional jail assault but they have and some DUIs driving under the influence of alcohol, but they have no other crime really to deal with in these rural sections. If you ever wonder why they're so in love with mandatory sentences and long sentences, it's real simple. There is a commerce in the bodies of people from the city that come to their counties and support their counties financially, but also support them politically, also support their infrastructure. There's a commerce in this. And uh, that means that in a place like Pennsylvania, where the minority party, which is the party of insurrection, which is the Republican Party, has managed to control things, even though there are more Democrats, what it actually means is that they are hanging on for dear life to their system of incarceration. It is a terrible threat to them at basically every level if we corrected this. Once you unravel that, you start to see a whole lot of things. You start to understand where it's all coming from. And it is it is an old story. I don't have to tell you that, but it's an old story. Yeah, I mean, here in, in Washington State, we have a similar uh, town by the name of Monroe um, that is sort of a, a similarly situated um, town that really kind of relies on um, the prison that's up there for um, basically a lifeline um, in many ways or did for many years. Um, our next question, let's see which one of these we want to go with. This one is interesting. How, to what extent can we generalize the extent, the success achieved by the Floyd prosecution, um, by the prosecute, the team that prosecuted uh, Derek Chauvin, where the state's governor appointed the state attorney general to take over the case from the start? Um, that is a question that is somewhat above my head, just as far as the technical aspects of it, but. Um, I think you probably know what it means. No, I'm, I'm I'm happy to try to answer that. So there has been a thought over time that um, if we take, you know, that the local DA is probably crooked. And if we take it, take the prosecutions away and we give it to this this good statewide attorney general, who is the statewide prosecutor, then we're going to go from the crooked local person to the one with integrity. Let me just tell you this. The prosecutor in the city of Philadelphia sued the police more than 75 times and kind of dedicated his life to, to things that have showed him where all of the bodies are buried. I would do a really good job and I am doing a really good job prosecuting police. Our statewide attorney general, no disrespect to him, but never tried a case in his life and is beloved of the Fraternal Order of Police in Philadelphia does press conferences with them, okay? Are you sure you want to do this in every state? In our state, and I say this with respect, I'm not trying to start a fight with anybody, but in our state, it'd be a fiasco. Um, I think there are probably a lot of states where it'd be a fiasco. There are other states where just because of who happens to be in the position, it's a good idea. But that is, a, that is really more a matter of individuals than personalities. And I think we should all be very, very careful before we take away from big city prosecutors elected by diverse populations we take away their power and we hand it over to someone who is able to attract votes statewide in states where there are large sections that are rural and are much less diverse. That actually, to me, sounds like potentially going the wrong direction. Absolutely. Um, so as we, we approach seven o'clock here, I want to see if we can get one more question in from the audience. Larry, it's been great uh, being able to talk to you um, to be able to hear about um, your experience. I mean, the 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 this aspect of kind of a, a roadmap for um, insurgent campaigns or candidates that really want to shake things up, I think, is a durative and really really important lesson that um, you know folks who are who are watching this presentation take home and really mull over um, and really digest. So, uh, going going to one last question here. Uh, what are some important incentives that need to be put in place to encourage pros prosecutorial accountability? Hmm, wow, that's great. Well, one that I would love to see is that if they framed you, you can sue them. I mean, in general, prosecutors are completely immune from lawsuits for anything they do in a courtroom. And while I understand 
that we don't want to have them uh, in a position where they can be sued for everything and anything they do. When you have prosecutors who knowingly violate the law, knowingly violate the Constitution, they put an innocent person in jail for 25 years. How is that anything but a kidnapping? Why should we say you can't be sued for that? I mean, I think you ought to. I think, you know, if that happened on my watch, they'd be lucky to get fired. They might very well get prosecuted for crimes. You know, obstructing justice is a crime in most most jurisdictions. And yet they're never prosecuted and they're, they almost are never sued because they can't be sued. Once again, you've created a vacuum of accountability for government. And what do you get? I'll tell you what you get in Philly. You get 18 exonerations so far. You get lawsuits for $10 million and $6 million that taxpayers have to pay and prosecutors and police will never pay there. So um, that, you know, in the same way we have forms of immunity for police that go too far, we have forms of immunity for prosecutors that go way too far and I think need to be clawed back. Absolutely. Um, Well, it's been it's been great being able to talk. Um, Larry, good luck with everything this year with your next uh, virtual virtual stop on your uh, on your book tour here. Um, I I suppose I should have started off this conversation just asking how um, quarantine has been with you and just what your experience in the in the last year or so that we've had um, has been like. Uh, Quarantine for me has been a different experience because I am, uh, you know, in reality, a first responder. So I have been in the office almost every day during this time period out in the, out in the community, uh, you know, masked up and so on for, for a very long period of time. Um, and so I haven't really had to deal with the isolation and, and a lot of the things a lot of other people are suffering through, but it's given me time to think, Sean, by the way, wonderful to have a chance to talk to you. I really appreciate the work that you do. I appreciate the way you stick up for broke people which I was once when I was growing up. Um, <laughs> I do. And I mean that, I mean that sincerely, but one of the things I thought about in quarantine is this. Um, aren't the people we want to run for office, the ones who don't think they want to run for office. I mean, shouldn't we be going around and saying, you really need to run for office to somebody who has expertise you know, has a moral compass, is really diligent, very talented. Shouldn't we find those people, especially if they have they have real experience in the relevant area and saying, hey, you're the one. Right. You, you need to go. And there's probably some people on this, on the, you know, on this call, whatever we're calling it, the Zoom, this thing. There's probably some people out there. I can't see any of you, but I can see you. Some of you ought to run. And some of you know people who ought to run. And you ought to go up to them and tell them two or three times while they say, get out of here. You should go up to them and say, you need to run, because that is how we actually will get somewhere. We can't just have all of our politicians be high schoolers who are, you know, whistling hail to the chief while they look in the mirror. We don't we don't need like ambitious narcissists. They're the ones who gave us mass incarceration. And there's a very direct correlation uh, between when, you know, when being a D.A. got you elected senator and when we got mass incarceration. So I hope people here will will know that I'm not just playing. I'm not just being aspirational. I'm being real. We need people to realize that they can overcome the party. They can get elected. They themselves and people they know, they can do this. They just have to be willing to think about it in a different way. Absolutely. Um, Yeah, I don't think that that message is going to be lost on on too many people here again, given that we're in the middle of an election year in Seattle, um, have an election here every every couple of years. Um, I would like to think that the uh, political culture in Seattle is as negative as some political ads can get is probably a walk in the park compared to Philly, but I'm basing that mostly just off of um, everything that I know about um, Philly Philly fans and their connection to the sports teams. I have to imagine that the politics can get um, equally equally uh, equally vitriolic in some ways. It, 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 this is the town that decapitated a wandering Canadian robot. So yes, this is this is a place where you know, as they say, when when you your sports team wins, they still get batteries thrown at their heads. It's right. it can be a little bit of a rough town. I mean, I love this town, but it can be a little bit of a rough town, and, and the politics are rough. And uh, hey, that's okay. It's a city with attitude, as we like to say. Right. And uh, and and you know, let's just say I can I can give as well as I can get, and that's just how it is. Yeah, Seattle is a little bit more passive aggressive than Philly, I think. Um must be the weather. Yeah. Maybe it's the weather. Yeah, I think I think the racists in Seattle would be more likely to mail you uh 
a set of batteries um, just to <laughs> let you know that they can um, rather than throw them at you. Larry, it's been it's been great talking with you. Thank you so much to um, everybody at Town Hall, everybody who's uh, joined us on this call this evening. Thank you, Sean. It was great talking to you. I'll see you soon in Seattle, maybe after Absolutely. the pandemic. Yeah, we would love to have you back. Um, on behalf of Town Hall, I just want to thank you both so much. Leah, thanks for the straight talk. And um, Sean, as always, thanks so much for, for moderating. I want to thank the audience as well. Thank you for your questions. Um, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of Larry's book, uh, please use the link in the chat and that'll take you right over to Elliott Bay. I also, if you don't mind, Larry, want to plug your PBS uh, series. I watched the first episode last night. It was really captivating. So I would encourage people to check that out as well. Um, but yeah, we'd love to have you uh, if you're in the area sometime. Um, hopefully we'll get through this uh, this next year. But um, until then, um, have a great night and thanks so much again. Thank you.